Welcome back everyone, Alex Javaris here with another master copy video. This time I'm going to be copying one of my all time favourite paintings, Juan de Perea by Diego Velasquez. In my previous Sargent copy video, I did say I was thinking of doing this one as a live stream. However, filming this the way I wanted to and doing it live was proving to be extremely complicated, so this isn't live but it's still being filmed in its entirety at normal speed, with nothing taken out. I'm not copying the whole painting, just the head, which was taken from this high-res image that I downloaded for free from the Metropolitan Museum of Art's website. It was really great to see all your Sargent copies after the last video, so there's a link in the description below if any of you want to have a go at this one. Right, so the colours I'm going to be using are loosely based on Velasquez's palette. I'm using ivory black, ultramarine, transparent oxide red, alizarin crimson, vermilion, naples yellow and titanium white. According to the book Velasquez The Technique of Genius by Jonathan Brown and Carmen Garrido, the exact colours Velasquez would have used were for his white, lead white mixed with calcite. For his yellow, he would have used lead tin yellow or Naples yellow. He would have had vermilion as an orange, red iron oxide and red lake for a darker red, azurite or lapis lazuli for blue, brown iron oxide, and it says a black of animal or vegetable origin. Right, so here I'm mixing some ivory black with a generous amount of solvent. And I'm going to start by toning my canvas. Here I'm adding just a touch of transparent oxide red to warm up the ground ever so slightly. The surface I'm using for this demo is some oil primed linen by a company called Russell and Chapel. I don't normally use pre-primed linen, I make my own because it's cheaper. But because I actually live quite far away from my studio at the moment, the current lockdown has meant that I haven't been able to go there as much. So I don't have any of my own canvases, but fortunately I've still been able to order this stuff online. And it's a nice surface. A lot of artists prefer working on a more absorbent surface, but I actually like the slicker surface of oil prime linen. If you're used to a more absorbent surface, the paint feels like it's harder to control, but I find the fact that the paint slips around more means I can do more with it. The brush I'm using for this wash is a large soft haired brush. One of the Master's Choice series by Rosemary & Co and it's probably the most expensive brush I own. Here I'm wiping back my wash with some paper towel. Once the wash is down, I'm ready to start mapping out the head. Here I'm using a soft haired Eclipse Coma brush by Rosemary & Co and some transparent oxide red. The reason I'm using a soft brush for this is because my ground is still quite wet. As I'm working at home and not in my studio, the solvent I'm using is a product called Zestit, a citrus based solvent which is much safer to breathe than the turpentine I normally use. However, it takes longer to evaporate and has a slower drying time. I could have wiped it back more but that would have made my ground much lighter and because this painting has a dark background I decided to leave it. I wouldn't recommend painting onto a wet ground like this, 
as things can very easily get messy. Leave your ground to dry for half an hour or so before you start painting. Because this is a demo, I don't have the luxury of waiting, so I just have to get on with it. So, I've started off by placing the whole head on the canvas with a few straight lines. Next, I'm placing a vertical centre line that runs down the middle of the face, down through the bridge of the nose and the middle of the mouth. This centre line will act as a guide for placing the features. If you've watched any of my other portrait demos, you'll have seen me start this way before. In fact, I've made a video about using these centre lines called How to Place the Features in a Portrait. I'll put a link in the description. Here I'm indicating the side of his face. And here I'm guessing where the top of his skull might be. Now, halfway in between the top of his skull and his chin, I'm placing a horizontal centre line for the bottom of his eyes. And here's a line for his nose. This next line is for his eyebrows and that's as much of the features as I'm going to draw for now. From here I'm going to start thinking about the light and dark shapes. And because my ground is still wet I'm going to start wiping away the lights with some paper towel. If your ground is dry, you can still wipe away your lights by using a little solvent. In fact, it's probably easier to control it that way. Here I'm starting to map out the light shape on the front of the left cheek. As I wipe this light shape away, do you see how something vaguely resembling a face is starting to emerge? Just with three light shapes placed approximately in the right place. This is like recognising someone we know from a distance. We can tell who they are just from the large light and dark shapes of their face. Way before we can make out the colour of their eyes or anything. Starting in this way, simplifying your subject into large light and dark shapes, is an optical approach to painting. It works the same way our eyes work. Everything we see is made of light. All the complex visual information the world presents us with are shapes projected onto the backs of our eyeballs. So when we paint, we're not actually painting an object in front of us, but rather we're painting the shapes light makes on the backs of our eyes. This is why it's possible to create the illusion of a 3D world just by fitting flat shapes together on a canvas. Now, it's rather appropriate while we're on this subject that I'm copying a Velasquez painting. Because it was Velasquez, along with other artists during the Baroque period, who discovered this optical approach to painting. Back in Velázquez's day, they didn't have the scientific knowledge we do today. They didn't actually know what light was, and they didn't know how our eyes worked. Up until that time, for the many thousands of years human beings have been painting, 
artists thought of the world in terms of form. By that I mean objects in space rather than phenomena of light. So everything they did was about structure. Obviously, this didn't mean they weren't able to produce outstanding works of art. Much of it, like Holbein for instance, superbly realistic. What it meant was that up until the Baroque period, artists thought in terms of line. So in much of the work they did, their shapes are still delineated. But during the Baroque period, a generation of artists, heavily influenced by Caravaggio and his use of light and dark chiaroscuro, started to observe the behaviour of light much more closely. They gradually became less reliant on their knowledge of form and started to paint what they actually saw. With Velázquez, you can actually see how he develops this knowledge when you compare his early paintings with his later work. And this painting in particular of Juan de Perea, alongside another he did at the same time of Pope Innocent X, are widely recognised as landmark paintings in the development of Velázquez's technique, when he perfected what was called his Manera Abreviada, to describe the looser, more painterly brushwork and soft edges he used to achieve his breakthrough in realism. And it's an incredibly lifelike portrait. Juan de Perea was Velázquez's assistant. He was of Moorish origin and at the time this was painted, he was also a slave. Given 16th century attitudes to race, and that this isn't a painting of a king or a duke, much has been made of the self-assurance and dignity with which Juan de Perea is portrayed. And I feel the same way. I think this is the reason I like this portrait so much. I like to think it says something about Velázquez's character, though I don't know how much we can really infer. We do know the two men were friends, and quite soon after this was painted, Velázquez gave Juan his freedom, and he went on to be a painter in his own right. This was painted in 1650 in Rome, just before Velázquez painted Pope Innocent X, which is another of my favourite paintings. Aside from his technical genius, the thing I absolutely love about Velázquez's work is the absolute honesty with which he portrays people. Even though they may be kings or popes, there's no flattery. You know you're looking back 400 years at a very real person. With Innocent X, we see this ruthless gangster who looks to me like he might be one of Gene Hackman's ancestors. You just know he'd have you gruesomely tortured and burned at the stake without batting an eyelid. Apparently, people were shocked at the time at how ruthless Velasquez had made him look. But the Pope loved it and hung the painting in his visitor's waiting room in order to intimidate his guests. So that's 16th century Popes for you. Anyway, I'm not the only one who loves these two paintings. They are both widely acknowledged as two of the finest portraits ever created. And because of his technical genius, Velázquez has been called the painter's painter. He had a huge influence on later artists, in particular Manet and other 19th century painters like Sargent, who adopted and developed this optical style of painting with its immediacy and more visible brushwork. So I'll say it again, Velázquez is very relevant to the approach of direct a la prima painting that I'm advocating on this channel. Anyway, that's enough of a digression into art history territory. I'm a bit wary of saying too much about such things because I'm sure some of you guys know much more about it than I do. So if I've said anything that isn't entirely accurate, please feel free to correct me and I'll get back to more technical matters.
As you can see from the last 10 minutes or so, I've been correcting and adjusting my light shapes. And I haven't yet gone into any more detail other than to remove some of the smaller light shapes around the eyes. What I've been doing is fine tuning and adjusting my light shapes, comparing their height and width, looking at the rectangle of the forehead and asking myself if it's too wide or too tall. Then looking at the distance down from the eyes to the bottom of the nose and from the nose out to the side of the face. Do you see how this area makes another small rectangle? By turning my subject into boxes and comparing their height and width, I'm thinking about my subject in terms of whole shapes or masses rather than outlines. And this way of drawing by seeing whole shapes instead of outlines is essential for this optical approach to painting. If we see the world as shapes made of light and we paint by fitting these shapes together on a flat surface, the dimensions of a flat surface are height and width. So if we want our painting to look like our subject, our shapes need to have the same height and width, or rather our shapes need to have the same height and width ratio as our subject. What this means is that there can only ever really be two things wrong with your drawing. It's either too wide or too tall. Unfortunately, it isn't quite that simple. Learning to see the world as flat boxes doesn't come naturally to us. Remember, it took thousands of years of painting before artists figured this out. We naturally tend to think of the world as objects in space that we can touch. So we draw an outline because we know it's there, rather than what we actually see. We're also hardwired to focus on details. In our everyday lives, we're always looking for specific things, like an item on a supermarket shelf or the number of a bus we're waiting for. Our survival depends on specifying rather than unifying. So learning to recognise the large shapes that make up your subject and ignore the details to see the whole before the parts takes a lot of practice. In fact, I still often find myself getting caught up in detail. So in that sense, painting is a bit like a mindfulness exercise where you're constantly catching yourself, focusing on detail and you have to bring yourself back to the larger shapes. And this ability to simplify your subject into larger shapes really is the key to this optical approach to painting. Now, if any of you guys want to learn exactly how you go about simplifying your subject into large masses and how you draw with them, parts one and two of my introduction to mass drawing course are now available to watch on my Patreon channel. I apologise for the blatant plug but I'm very proud of this course. In it, I use a series of really simple exercises to show you exactly how all this stuff works. I honestly reckon it's probably the most valuable teaching I have to offer. Right, so here I've just about finished adjusting my light shapes and I've also wiped away the collar. I'm now ready to go in with colour. If you've watched any of my other portrait demos, you'll have seen I often start by massing in the lights with a flesh tone. But with this portrait, because the shadows are so dark, I'm going to mass them in first, transparently. So here I'm mixing some ivory black with some viridian to create a very warm dark. The brush I'm using 
is a long-haired synthetic brush called an Eclipse Coma by Rosemary & Co. I'm using this brush because my ground is still quite wet and the soft hairs of the Eclipse Coma enable me to place my shadow colour on top without disrupting the wet paint underneath. This is what soft haired animal or synthetic brushes are good for when you're painting onto a wet layer of paint underneath. Though this can still be quite tricky because as you apply the paint you need to press quite lightly. I also find softer brushes are good for the transparent darks because they apply the paint quite thinly and evenly. A build up of paint in the darks can be distracting because the darker colours reflect more light and as they get thicker you'll start getting glare off the strands left by the brush. This is also why you'll notice all of my brush strokes in the darks are in a downwards direction. Horizontal brush marks in the darks will also give you glare. Now you definitely don't have to use softer brushes to mass in transparent shadows like this. You can do it very easily with just bristle brushes. And Velasquez certainly didn't use all the fancy Rosemary & Co brushes that I'm using. Though it helps if you're using bristles that the surface you're working on is reasonably dry. Another thing to look out for is not going over the same area again and again because the stiffer hairs of the bristle will lift off the paint underneath. Generally opaque colours, for example any mixture with white in it, are more forgiving when it comes to building up paint and can be easier to manipulate. But there's something about the warmth and richness of colour in these transparent shadows that can't be achieved with opaque paint. Particularly for the very dark shadows of these high contrast baroque paintings. Now. I'd like to point out that at this stage I'm not yet using any medium. Velasquez however would have painted these shadows with glazes, diluting his colours with oil to make them more transparent. Here I'm just adjusting the width of the collar making it a little wider by wiping it away with some paper towel. Next I'm mixing an even darker colour for the hair using ivory black and transparent oxide red. and I'm laying it down in the same way I did the shadows with the same Eclipse Coma brush. Which by the way, before mixing this new colour, I cleaned with solvent. In order to keep your colours clean, it's important to remember that each time you mix a new colour, you try to use a clean brush. Either by cleaning the brush you're using in solvent, or by grabbing a fresh one. Right. Here I've decided to make my hair colour a little cooler. So I'm mixing a new black made with ultramarine and transparent oxide red. I use this mixture of blue and brown to make black quite a lot as I find ivory black tends to be a little duller. But I'm fairly certain Velasquez didn't use any blue in his darks for this painting. In Velasquez's day, blue pigments were costly, so they would have been used sparingly. And even though the colours I'm using are based on Velasquez's palette, I think he may have used far fewer colours when he did this painting. I don't know, but I think he may have just used black, brown and red. So, if any of you guys decide to have a go at this, don't feel you need to get hold of all the colours I'm using. The Zorn palette will be fine for this. In fact, in some of my other videos, you'll have seen me use a limited palette of transparent oxide red and ultramarine, which as you'll see in a bit, I use for the flesh colours in this. 
and I reckon you could do an okay version of this painting with just those two colours. Remember, this isn't a conservation exercise. We're not trying to replicate Velasquez's techniques and materials exactly. You'll still learn a hell of a lot about the decisions he made, his colour choices and his modelling, approaching this the same way you would any subject, with the colours you normally use. You can see, now that I'm massing in this really dark colour, I'm starting to get some slight patches of glare. I'm afraid that because I wasn't working in my studio for this demo, but I was working at home next to my computer, this is the best I could do with the available lighting. Glare can often be an issue, and it's one of the main things that makes filming painting demonstrations a bit more complicated than just talking into your phone. Now, I had said I would be doing this demo as a live stream, but filming this the way I wanted to, with shots of both canvas and palette and the reference on screen, while at home and doing it live was proving to be really difficult. There is software available that will enable you to have multiple shots on screen like this live, but I needed to buy HDMI encoders for both of my cameras and a load of cables I didn't have. And I think I'd blatantly struggle having to think about all that stuff while painting and trying to explain what I'm doing. If and when I eventually do do a live stream, I think I'm going to need a producer. For now, I decided filming this the way I do my other videos, although it takes much longer to edit, would turn out a lot better. Even though I've done loads of painting demos for the students in my classes, I actually find it quite hard talking and painting at the same time. This way I can focus on the painting and then think more carefully about explaining what I'm doing afterwards. If I was doing this live, I'd probably end up waffling on about all kinds of nonsense. So here, I'm lightly brushing over my darks with a soft dry brush to smoothen out any brush marks as they were starting to look a bit busy and distracting. I'm going to be painting onto these darks, building up more paint later on, so I want these bottom layers to be quite thin and even. Here, to make the darks even thinner, I'm going to scrape them back with my palette knife. If I was working on a drier surface, I wouldn't have needed to do this. I could have just rubbed my darks thinly onto the canvas using a bristle brush. Here I'm evening out the marks left by the palette knife by gently wiping over them with a large soft dry brush. This is the same brush I used for the wash at the start. I think it's a size 12 Master's Choice Series 275 Long Flat by Rosemary & Co. Here I'm just adjusting the shape of the hair by wiping it back with a paper towel. So, 
I now have this nice thin even layer of transparent darks ready for painting onto. Next I'm going to start massing in the lights. Here I'm mixing a flesh tone made of transparent oxide red, titanium white and a small amount of ultramarine blue to cool it down slightly. And that's way too orange. It's a really easy mistake to make your flesh colours too bright and saturated. They're often greyer and more neutral than we think. So here I'm greying down my flesh colour with more blue and white. That's a bit better. So once I'm happier with my flesh colour, I'll start massing in the whole of the light area. The brush I'm using is a size 8 hog bristle by Cornelison and Son. The firmer hairs of bristle brushes hold more paint, so they're better for when you want to apply the paint thickly, like with these lighter opaque colours. If you look closely at the forehead in the high res image from the Met, you'll notice all the interesting textures Velasquez has achieved with impasto paint. He did this by using a mixture of lead white and calcite, a kind of chalk. You can actually buy a Velasquez impasto medium made with calcite. And I'm not entirely sure, but he may have achieved this texture by building up the lead white and letting it dry before glazing over it with flesh colour. Unfortunately, with the titanium white that I'm using and my limited skill, I don't think my forehead will turn out anywhere near as interesting as the original. Once the lights have been massed in, I can see that my flesh colour is too light. Now, it isn't actually as light as it appears in this video. The exposure on the camera is making it look even lighter, but even so, I'm still going to have to darken it. So here, I'm scraping back my thicker flesh colour, ready to paint over it. And here I'm mixing a darker version of my flesh colour by adding more transparent oxide red and ultramarine. I'm now repainting the light areas. With my overall flesh colour finally established, I'm next going to start thinking about the highlights. Here I'm mixing a cooler, lighter highlight colour simply by adding white to my main flesh colour. Using a size 4 filbert hog, I'm going to start by placing the highlight on the forehead.
Here, I'm using the back of my brush to scratch out the really bright highlight just above the brow. And here, I'm scratching out the really small highlight on the bridge of the nose. This lines up right underneath the left edge of the highlight on the brow. I find these small highlights really useful for drawing as they provide small anchor points that I can line up vertically or horizontally with each other. And the small highlight on the bridge of the nose, as you will see, is a really key landmark for placing the rest of the features. So here I'm scratching out the small highlight on the upper eyelid which I see as lining up horizontally with the highlight on the bridge of the nose. Using the back of my brush to scratch out these highlights before painting them in makes it much easier to correct them if I make any mistakes. And notice how slowly and deliberately I'm working constantly checking and rechecking my drawing. Right, here I'm placing the highlight in the corner of the eye, right under the right tear duct which I see as being at a 45 degree angle down from the highlight on the bridge of the nose. Once I'm happy they've been placed accurately, I'll paint them in with some of my highlight colour. Here I'm double checking the highlight in the corner of the eye. Do you see how these three highlights on the bridge of the nose, on the eyelid and under the corner of the eye make a small triangle shape? Here I'm placing the highlight on the tip of the nose which lines up vertically underneath the corner of the eye. And here I'm placing the small highlight on the cheek just to the right of the nose, which lines up right underneath the highlight on the upper eyelid. The highlight on the cheek then flows downwards at a 45 degree angle carving out the bottom of the nose. I'm now scratching out the highlight above the left eye, which again lines up horizontally with the highlight on the bridge of the nose. Here I'm placing the iris of the left eye with some of the dark I used for the hair.
and here I'm scratching out the highlight in the corner of the left eye. Notice how the highlights in the corners of the eyes and the bridge of the nose make another small triangle shape. When I draw, I'm always on the lookout for these small geometric shapes. So, now that I have all of the highlights placed accurately, I'm ready to paint them in with some of my highlight colour. Do you see how I'm using the highlight to carve out the nose? Here, I'm using some of my flesh colour to adjust the highlight above the right eye, making it smaller. And here, I'm placing the highlight above the left eye. Again, checking that it lines up correctly with the highlight above the right eye. Right, here I'm mixing a new mid-tone colour. This is a value in between my flesh colour and the shadows, which I see as being quite warm. So I'm using vermilion and Naples yellow, along with transparent oxide red and blue to make a warm reddish brown. Here I'm using my new mid-tone to mass in the side plane of the nose, which I see as lighter than the shadow. So I now have the main light and dark tonal values for my subject established. I have the darks, the shadow and the hair, a mid-tone for the transitions in between the shadows and the lights, my flesh colour, which is the main light, and finally, the highlights. And do you see how even though it needs a lot more refining, with just these four main values, I have something that looks a lot more 3D than the flat shapes I had previously. Here, I'm adding some of my mid-tone to the edge of the shadow on the left cheek. And see how it turns the form with just one brush stroke. This is just like a sculptor with a block of marble. A sculptor will start by carving out the big planes of an object before refining and smoothing it out by chiselling away smaller and smaller planes. These four main values represent the big planes of our subject. From here, I will start refining the head further by adding smaller shapes with more gradual value shifts in between the four main values. So, this is the blocking stage of my painting, complete. The blocking at the start is the most important stage of a painting because it's at this stage that I establish the large masses. From here, I can proceed to the refining stages. This is how I start all my paintings. Whether it's a quick study or something I'll be working on for weeks, I'll aim to get the blocking done within the first hour or so.
Right, so now that we've reached the end of the beginning, as it were, I think that's a good place to take a break and end part one of this demo. In part two, I'm going to start work on the eyes, which hopefully I'll have finished editing by next week. In the meantime, I hope you guys enjoy this video and that it gives you something to keep you occupied with everything that's going on. All your comments and support have certainly been helping me at the moment. So, take good care of yourselves and thank you for watching.